when you're fighting, as I was as an infantryman, about six times a day you're in a position in which you think, this is how I'm going to die. You don't see how you're going to escape. Maybe you're under a bombardment of mortar shells, and you know that they're fired in a pattern. You drop a shell in the tube, they give a little twist, and then drop another one in, another little movement, so that it, it, it becomes a box pattern. And you can see one, two, and you're right in the position where the third one is. So you know it's already in the air. The children who had become the greatest generation had a charmed childhood. There was no fear of being molested or being attacked in any way. In the summertime, you went out the door after breakfast and sauntered back around noon for a bowl of soup and a sandwich, and off you went again. And he never showed up until about five. And your parents never asked you where you'd been, or where did you go? They were at ease. I was lucky to live on a dead end street. It, it was, was our, our baseball, baseball field, field and our football, and football field. field. It ended in a large woods where we played out the adventures of Prince Valiant, Flash Gordon, or Cowboys and Indians. All the kids wanted to be the Indians. We built camps and roasted potatoes. Bikes gave us the freedom to visit the city dump, where we found wonderful stuff like race cars with orange crates for the hoods. We made our own weapons. We made our own shields. We made our own arrows. Their points were flattened tin, cut out of the cans. Their feathers were feathers we found on the ground. The thread was stolen from some mom's sewing basket. We never thought of buying stuff at the store. When one of my friends would be killed right alongside of me, the first thought that entered my mind was the image of a telegraph boy going up to the house, a family's worst nightmare. would think that the first thought would be, hey, this wonderful guy, I appreciate so much. What a wonderful guy. He's now been killed. But no, my thoughts went immediately to the parents and how crushed they would be that they lost a son like this. My mother died when I was only 11. Nevertheless, she made such a strong impression on me that even if she had lived to be 90, I simply would have seen more instances of her character that I knew very, very well by the age of 11 and even earlier. Whenever I became ill, she would bring up a tray of food that I loved, cinnamon toast and a pot of tea, puddings that I liked. She saw to it that I read widely because she herself loved books. So at the age of 10, I had already read Tom Sawyer and Moby Dick, <laughs> even Little Women. In that book, I remember the comments about liberating dresses for women to allow the flow of the body to breathe naturally in the wind. Of course, I, I never told any of my buddies that I was reading Little Women.
My dad was a remarkable man. He was a wonderful dad. In those days, males did not hug one another or their children. They didn't hug them and say, I love you, you know I love you. Males were supposed to keep their emotions inside of them. But I could tell that my dad loved me. When I was 17 or so, he gave me the key to the house. And he said, well, son, you can be your own boss now. We found that you were a very responsible boy, and so we trust you now. Fathers would give a handshake, pet on the back. Usually they wouldn't say anything. But to their neighbors, well, they would boast about their child. Fairly often, my dad and mom would go to a formal dinner, and he would be dressed in a tuxedo, my mother in an evening gown, and long white gloves, jewels in her hair. She looked like a movie star. She was a wonderful cook, and she cooked things that I've never encountered since. There was always a coffee pot on the stove, they made coffee by cracking a couple of eggs in the grounds and swishing it around in the bottom, shells and all, and you had a rich, real cup of coffee. The season of fall would come, and with it the harvest, the stores would be filled with all this marvelous food, and the mothers would can all sorts of preserves, conserves, corn relish, tomatoes, tomato sauce, pickles, sweet and sour. We had a root cellar. It was a, a separate room in a basement with an earth floor with huge bins filled with potatoes, onions, turnips, and squash. And the walls were lined with shells and stocked with the products of my mother's canning. Often I would be in the kitchen before supper. My mom would call out, run down and bring me up a jar of this or a can of that, all sealed with wax on the top. My mother, unfortunately, developed cancer. And when I was in the sixth grade of grammar school, she died. She was 41. My dad used to take her to radium treatments in Buffalo. And when he went to pick her up, he would take me along, so I'd be there to welcome her. She was ill in bed at home for about five months, and the bedroom faced the street. My dad bought her a car and parked it at the curb so that she could see it from her bedroom. He said, that's for you when, when you beat this thing and get well. But he knew. The thought of entering the priesthood first came to me when I was in my junior year of high school. It was just a possibility, just a thought, just a thought. Of course, World War II broke out then. And I thought, well, I'll go into the Army and fight the war, and if I live through that, I'll come back to this thought. Beyond the obvious fact that the war had to be fought, most of us viewed the war as an interruption, 
It, it wasn't real life. Real life was having a job, having a family, watching your children grow, going to a university. That was real life. So we were in a rush to get the war over with as soon as we could. In fact, the Americans wanted the war to be over as fast as possible. But to do that, they knew they would have to pay the price in casualties. And that's why, despite heavy losses, they pressed on and on. to shoot to kill. I was either assaulting enemy positions or fighting off counterattacks. You might ask, well, did it trouble you afterwards? Is this a, a burden of guilt that you have to carry once you have taken a life? And I would say no, because I knew the circumstances under which I acted. I knew that we were in a war with our backs to the wall, that it meant slavery and death if Hitler were not taken care of. I knew that. I knew that it was a war that had to be fought and won. Religious faith gave me great strength, inner strength. Because I said to God, every day I said, I place myself in your hands. If you want to take me, fine. I'd like to live longer, but it's up to you. So I was ready, I, I was ready. I was always ready to die. When I was fighting, I would go for weeks without being able to take my boots off. At night, we would dig our foxholes where we were, and we would sleep in the foxholes. You didn't dare take your boots off, partly because of the cold, and partly because of the counterattacks that could take place at night. You never knew. One of my fellow soldiers was a guy named Lou Epstein. I was with him for more than a year and a half before we ever got overseas. Lou had a wry sense of humor, was a born comedian and a wonderful companion. He was my best friend. But he, he was eventually one of our casualties. Germans were fighting a defensive war, so, so we were always on the attack against strong German defensive positions. Germans would take the ground in front of the line and make a grid of it on paper. Then they would give various features numbers on that grid. Each number had exact settings for their mortars or artillery. For example, if a group of Americans were advancing up a draw, the enemy spotter would simply call in and say, 22, and in a second, the draw would be pounded. So we're always attacking defensive positions. And if we did drive the Germans off, we knew 100% without a doubt 
that within 20 minutes they would counterattack. They always counterattack. So when you took a ridge, for example, you immediately started digging a foxhole because you knew that they were going to counterattack. This was one of many, many days that all started blurring together like a fog. Same scenario where you would approach a position until they fired at you from under camouflage. So it was the same story over and over all the time. And it was during one of these counterattacks a mortar round came in and wounded Lou seriously. I knew he was seriously wounded. His stomach had opened up. And of course, I started yelling for a medic immediately and did what I could, trying to put a pack under his head. him about 20 minutes to die and all through those 20 minutes he was trying to get me to laugh as he always was able to do quips one after another right up to the last minute he was trying to make me laugh that was Lou so tired that you are exhausted and you fall back on formal prayer. That is, you, you fall back on the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, because your energy just can't get up to this personal conversation with God. You're just exhausted. I still feel Lou's dying just as much as I did the day he died, almost in my arms. It is still as fresh a wound as ever. It never heals. As do the faces and voices of the other men I knew who were killed. I never, never forget. And of course, they are always 19. And so, keeping others around you alive, well, that was very, very important. That was first. We were brothers. So much so that we wrote home to our parents saying that if we were killed, please don't bring our remains back. Leave us buried with those who died around us. Now, I sent that message home in a letter. I don't know what my dad and the other parents thought. They were probably horrified. Has he forgotten us? Does he realize that it hurts us, that he doesn't want to be buried in our family plot? They could never understand the strong bonds that had formed over more than three years of suffering and struggle. On my return, I, I never spoke of this to my dad. In my last nine months in the Army, I was in the Philippines. We rounded up Japanese troops holding out in the mountains. Then our company was sent up north to guard supply warehouses. Now what I liked about that was that apart from the hours of guard duty, they left us alone. And even when we were pulling watch, walking alone through those areas with the warehouses, your mind was free to think. So, of course, I was thinking, well, what should I major in in the university when I get back home? My dad had suggested that I be an engineer. 
So I thought, yeah, my best marks were in math and science. That's what I'll be. After engineering, I can go on to architecture, my real love. So I had my future nicely planned out. But, but I, I kept having this recurring thought, the thought that I had in high school, that Christ was calling me. It wasn't a physical voice, but when I listened, I could hear it. It would kind of come up like the wind, and it sounded so right. What I'd like you to do is to be a priest. It's an invitation. You can say no, but that's what I'd like. If you say no, I will give you the same blessings and the same love as if you had said yes. I, I couldn't shake that voice. Here I am, having this dialogue with God, and I said, Are you out of your mind? Are you crazy? Everybody I know would make a better priest than I would. Next to my utter unworthiness, I suppose the hardest thing was that I would have to give up having children. So I, I fought tooth and nail, dug in my heels, but I couldn't shake that voice. My dad had a really comfortable amount of money to leave me, and here I was, turning my back on everything he had planned for me, as well as all the work he had put in preparing for my future. And since I was his only son, he would also have to face the family line ending with me. Nonetheless, I told him that I wanted to become a priest. And so, for 60 years, I've been a Brazilian priest. And I've taught English literature at St. John Fisher College in Rochester where my students have been the center of my life and whom I love beyond words. As a teacher, I'm, I'm trying to open doors, not only in literature, but in the realm of ideas and philosophies. Just as in my army days, when doors opened for me, I was together with a group from all the different states meeting people from all different levels. Some had spent a year at Harvard and came from wealthy families. Some came from the slums of New York, from different religions. All had something to give me, just like the students I taught, who taught me in turn. And sometimes in my classes, I would look down at these 18 and 19 year olds and I would smile to myself a bit and I would think how lucky they were to be here and not in a world war having their friends killed around them. And I would think of my two homecomings from Europe and from the Philippines and I thought of the story of Agamemnon Agamemnon had just conquered Troy, and far away, back in his home city of Mycenae, comes a messenger all the way from Troy, bringing news of the victory to the city. And he falls on his knees, scoops up a handful of earth, kisses it, and says, Never, never did I ever dream that I would be returning to my native home.